Among the Antarctic Division's hours of archival film and video, you can find this. 14 rolls of unreadable 35mm film shot over nine months in 1974. The series description says these kind of abstract expressionist images have something to do with ultra low frequency radio waves in the upper atmosphere. They seem to be what film archivists call data film. Data film is an especially utilitarian use of film. It's the use of moving image technologies for purposes other than entertainment, training, education, art or persuasion. Weapons testing documentation, scientific observations, surveillance footage, these are data film. The National Archives holds film recorded by the Australian Antarctic Division. We see penguins, seals, ships and sleds, and everyday life over several decades of Australian science in Antarctica. The Earth is protected by the Earth's magnetic field, which forms a bubble around the Earth, and the solar wind can't enter into the lower atmosphere because of the Earth's magnetic field. However, the magnetic field of the Earth merges into the magnetic field of the solar wind, and the two only meet in the polar regions. So Antarctica is important in that you get unique phenomena occurring in the polar regions that you need to understand to be able to predict what's going on. When you see that footage, it's like, wow, I remember doing that. It's amazing. <laughs> now we got this directive from head office. Oh, we think we should have some videos for training of the new expeditioners. Can you do us a video? And we were like, oh, well, right, we'll do a video, you know. <laughs> now, welcome to the world of film. This is a laser line. We were just ordinary people making videos. <laughs> we weren't professional filmmakers, so some of it's pretty awful. Okay, doing something over there, Mike. Cool. Panning down to Penny. Yeah. Down. Hang on, yeah. The video of the training video, that was what I did every day. And they were the instruments that I worked with every day. So for me personally, it probably is a much more indicative of my time and, and the office that I worked in and the instruments I was working with. There's two of us here at the moment uh, over winter. Mike's an electronics engineer and I'm a physicist. We notionally divided the experiments between us. I was running the optical instruments and Mike was responsible for the radar. Yeah, that's right. The aurora is produced from energy in the solar wind. There's a stream of particles given off by the sun. To come into the Earth's atmosphere, they also have to travel down the magnetic field lines, and the only region in the atmosphere that they can do that is in the poles. So aurora occur in the polar regions. The first thing is understanding what's going on. What's happening in the Earth's atmosphere? We can see that something's happening. What's producing the aurora? And why does it change in the way that we see it changes? It's because of the interaction between the solar wind and the particles in the Earth's atmosphere, it produces waves and influxes of particles. The sun can directly affect things on Earth. One is our reliance on satellites. 
To keep the satellites up there, we need to know what's happening in the solar wind. And something like a solar storm can wipe out satellites. And what they do is they have little gas cylinders that they can use to correct a satellite's orbit. If they know a solar event's happening, they can turn satellites around so that the sensitive equipment isn't exposed. The films that I was used to working with were the all-sky camera films. They had fisheye lens and looked from horizon to horizon. So you had a record of what the aurora was doing in the sky. Ideally, you'd take as many as you could, as often as you could, but that would take too much film. So that you had enough information to have an idea of what was going on, you'd say, take a photo every minute. So you could look at a night in three minutes. Penny explained that the 1974 black and white footage and its abstract patterns are photographed as individual frames. They are recording low frequency interference or micro pulsations in the upper atmosphere that can be detected as sound and captured on film. Scientists looked at things like radio waves and said, oh, we can hear things on the radio that are being produced by natural phenomena and they're worse in polar communications. So there have to be something going on in the polar areas that explains what those noises are. Using film to record scientific data was a standard technique through 60s, 70s and 80s. Dark rooms were set up. Then you developed it and you knew and you could look and see, yes, the instrument's working properly. <laughs> It's a record of events occurring in the atmosphere that we can't reconstruct in any other way. Well, my whole professional career has been involved with Antarctic science. This is my fifth time down here. I've had two winter trips and three summer trips over a 16 year time span. It's a challenging place to work and I enjoy the remoteness of the environment here and the beauty and the lack of people in Antarctica is something I really like. And it is a pressure cooker, you can't yeah. get away from it. And that's why the dogs were so great when they had the dog teams at Mawson. There were 26 personalities on the dog line and the people who worked with the dogs should just talk about them and say, oh, this is happening and this dog did this and this dog did that. And you could make fun of them and laugh and joke and, and you weren't insulting anyone. <laughs> I think he's my bear. <laughs> it was a really amazing time of my life. I miss doing science. I haven't actually done science for 20 years. I would prefer to work as a scientist than as anything else. <laughs> when you're trained as a scientist, that rigorous thinking through things really carefully, yes, no, what is the question? How can we test the question? What answer do we see? It actually changes the whole way you approach everything. Okay, is there anything else? No! <laughs>